What's up? Today, I'm here with Katie Kay. She's a serial entrepreneur, investor, and coach. And Katie built and sold her 12 companies and became a self-made millionaire by the age of 23. She now runs multiple companies and teaches other entrepreneurs how to grow, scale, and sell strategically. Welcome to the show, Katie. Hello, thank you for having me. Great. So maybe you can start off by sharing a little bit more about your entrepreneurship journey. How do you get started? And then we'll just go on from there. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Um, so my entrepreneurship journey started at a young age. I started at 19 with a retail business. Um, and I started very small, little farmer's booth market, little stand and a tablecloth. It was nothing fancy. Um, but I grew and scaled that to uh, 10 locations globally, two wholesale companies globally. I went on to um, replicate and sell my model as well. Um, and I was in the vape and CBD industry when I started. So um, yeah, that, that was my first journey into it. It was retail based, brick and mortar based. Um, and I absolutely loved it. Had to go through the challenges and learn early um, and, and grow from there. Okay. I started when I was 19 as well, and I made my first million by the time I was 23, so I think it's the exact same path, and we're, we're both JT same. students. So yeah. um, how do you um, build 12 companies? Was it was it the same company, or was 12 different companies, and how do you sell them? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it was all the, the brick and mortars were all the same retail companies, um, and then I had two wholesale companies that were selling the products that I were selling also in the brick and mortars. Um, and it was just two different demographics. So we had North America running and we also had Europe running. So, um, right in between there, we expanded to Europe, Europe. Um, and one thing that we actually found when we went to Europe was, um, so I was in the vape and CBD industry, but they had, um, different flavors that they had in North America. They didn't have in Europe and things they had in Europe, they didn't have in, um, North America. So it kind of worked crossways. Okay. Um, so we'd be shipping product this way and shipping product that way and implementing it in all the locations as well. So um, what other business strategies do you use to grow your business? So business strategies um, definitely get very good at repetition, but you really got to get the foundation down. Um, so I've been in a lot of kind of meetings and coachings recently and people are coming in and they don't have that foundation down. I didn't start scaling until I made sure that that first, um, I call it the cookie. You can't fill the cookie box until you have the first cookie mm -hmm. and it tastes amazing, right? So um, I always start with that and start with my foundation and making sure that systems are working, processes are working, the product is the right product. It is what the customer wants, the marketing's in place. And I think sometimes people go too big too soon um, and I even had that mistake on my third store. I had a, a big, big no, no ended up going into my biggest competitor was three doors down. Mm -hmm. Um, and I lost a lot of money, a lot really fast. Uh, so I had to pivot quickly. Um, now that could have taken the whole thing down, but the key was to remember that I had my foundation that was so well, um, made that even though I missed something or I didn't see something, um, which was definitely my responsibility. Uh, it was one of those key learning uh, moments in my life where I was able to pivot and keep growing. So I think when it comes to strategy, it, it definitely is all about that foundation. You have to have that foundation first before you scale. So in terms of, strat uh, in terms of pivoting, what do you mean by that? Like um, how tough was it to pivot? You know, tell me more. Like it was yeah. probably a little bit tough to pivot, right? But tell me more about it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, pivoting in any aspects of business, you got to be very quick to do it. Um, and you have to be very good at making those decisions fast. So in that case, um, I lost like $35,000 in less than 30 days. At that point, that is a lot of my money going out the door. Right. Um, and I had to think, okay, now I have all this product. I basically have a full store. What am I going to do now? So we started mm -hmm. stripping product, throwing it in other stores and, and things like that. And just coming up with ways that we could still keep expenses down, generate, so that we didn't go under the water and lose it all. Um, that required quick, quick decision thinking. That required creative thinking. Um, and 
I have to obviously sublet that unit out, et cetera, et cetera. So just making those quick rational decisions um, and being confident in them. So once you make that decision, go with it. Um, the opposite of that decision could have been, let's ride out this wave and ride out the storm, um, which would have probably, I wouldn't be here today if I did that. So um, yeah, being very confident in your decision once you make it and to pivot. Um, fundamentals in business do not change. So it doesn't matter the market you go into. Um, you just need to be confident in those decisions. Now let's talk more about um, you selling the businesses. Um, how do you find the buyer and how was the sales process like? How long did it take? Yeah, take me through that. Um, yeah, so in some cases we were approached um, for pieces. It was not all sold as one big bundle. Um, as far as uh, locations, it, sometimes it was an employee that wanted to take it over. Um, or it was a customer, which was kind of interesting. So I strategically put myself in each location um, to sell the location, knowing that I was looking for someone to take it over, to buy it. Um, and that, that was how I sold them. Um, now I've been a part of selling other businesses and things like that. Um, you need to make it appealing. You need to make sure that the business is functioning to a level in which you know who your buyer is, right? So if I go and buy a company right now, I do not want to have to be working at that company. I mm -hmm. want to buy a company that's so self-sufficient, that has a great manager that's coming along with it, um, and that I know it's not going to require tons and tons of my time other than a little bit of tweaking. So when I'm looking at opportunities, that's what I'm looking for. So as the business owner and going to sell your business, you need to kind of clarify what market you're going into. Um, a lot of people, if you want a big private equity to buy you or someone to buy you, you have to have it so well, it has to be such a well running machine. Um, and the teams need to be in place so that they can acquire it, you know, bring in what they can capital or resources to grow it themselves. Um, but it's not going to require them to sit in the store and sell whatever you were selling or whatever the case may be. Right. So, um, that's how I did it in mine, but I have been involved in, in different sales where, um, we just really needed to know who the buyer was. So those 12 businesses, were they all under the same brand or it was like 12 different brands? Uh, they were all different. Some of them were in same names, um, but they were all kind of their own own brand just because they were in different locations. If there were like three, I had three together, uh, they kind of fell under the same umbrella name. Um, but the thing with my stores was, so I couldn't market. I couldn't do mainstream marketing, mm -hmm. um, which meant that the only really trick I had up my sleeve was I would put the um, city name in my business name, which I would never recommend to anybody. I wouldn't ever say like, if your name's Katie, don't go open Katie's cake house and I sell cakes there, right? Mm -hmm. um, never use your name, never use your city. It's usually my biggest uh, advice. But in this case, because I couldn't uh, market, it worked for search engines. Mm -hmm. So if they searched up uh, Toronto vape shop and I had Toronto in my name, I was popping up first. Yeah. So, so that was um, how I did it. But yeah, they were all kind of umbrella as different brands. So, so why don't you recommend that for other business owners? Like, I think that's a good strategy if you want to get, you know, search engine traffic. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So it, the reason I don't recommend it is because you can't sell it, right? It is then your business, like Joe's auto shop or um, Bob's Diner. Well, who's mm -hmm. Bob? What if Bob doesn't own it anymore, right? Mm -hmm. It yeah. very much then kind of turns into, now, yes, you can have like a third level name. Some people do that, but um, it's very, very hard to scale and sell because they're always going to be looking for who's Bob. And if Bob wants to open three stores, well, where's Bob? Mm -hmm. So uh, never tie anything like that to your, to your name. Um, City is a little bit more lenient but mm -hmm. definitely not your personal name because you can't sell that. What, what do you think about, but, but, but what about a city name? Do you, you think city is okay? You, yeah, I think it depends on like the industry, depends mm -hmm. on the business. Um, but yeah, I, I've seen a lot of companies that are successful that kind of do that. I think it's more of really the industry. It's not a name, so it's not you, right? But you also kind of get into to issues of other people are doing it in different industries, right? So you keep using Toronto as the example, but like Toronto's auto shop mm -hmm. and then there's Toronto's bake shop. Mm -hmm. And it, that's another thing that's hard to search. Right. So, and you're, and you're, 
you're tunneling down your vision, right? You can't scale that globally. Right. You're not going to put a Toronto auto shop in Hawaii, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, yeah, it, it's, it just puts restrictions on growing and scaling your business. So let's um, let's talk more about the legal process and like how much did it cost to you know sell the business? Like how much did you pay the lawyers, pay the M and A specialists, and all this kind of stuff? Yeah. Um, I well, because I sold them myself. Lawyers, not that much. Okay. I mean, I would pay a couple couple thousand each. It wasn't that much. Okay. Um, I have a nice family lawyer that did that for me, but <laughs> um, yeah, I didn't use a brokerage. I didn't use um someone to sell my business. So mm -hmm. it would really be like kind of privately selling your house. Okay. Um, if you were to privately sell your house, you just need a lawyer to fill out the paperwork, right? So yeah. Um, yeah, we didn't have any brokerage fees or I had to hire a consultant to do it. I didn't have to market it because once again, I couldn't market. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there wasn't much expense in there. So when you sold the thing, was there any earn out or like you received cash straight away or you got a, a, you know, a portion of shares and... It was full cash or what, what do you get when you sold uh, it? For, so for each one, it was different. Um, if it was an employee that did it over, uh, mm -hmm. took it over, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. what I did was I reverse financed them. So we okay. had cash down and then they reverse financed me um, for different terms. It might've been a year, might've been uh, six months, nine months in there. Um, one I did was 24 months, but I genuinely believed in that person. So um, And it all turned out fine. So it wasn't an issue. Um, but yeah, there was always a cash um, cash commitment. Like you need to have a cash commitment. Um, and that all needs to be in writing for sure. So did every single one manage to pay you on time in the yeah. end? Everyone. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that's didn't have any yeah, there was only a few that was actually employees where I reverse finance. So mm -hmm. everything else was cash. Yeah. Got it. So, um, then let's talk about how do you normally get client? Like, okay. So you got clients through search engine, right? Um, so you couldn't run any Facebook ads, you couldn't run any Google ads, Google ads you couldn't run. So, okay. Nothing, yeah. Um, yeah, so generating clients was a, it required me to think outside the box. I really genuinely think, you know, I think it, I look back at it, it's kind of funny, like I own vape shops, it's just a random market to be in, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it taught me so much um, because I couldn't, for example, advertise. Um, and there was laws and restrictions and this and that. So couldn't do Facebook ads, couldn't do Google, any sort of mainstream marketing you could think of, I couldn't do. Mm -hmm. um, there was an interview article of me in a newspaper and they almost took it out because it was the type of industry it was. And then they were like, no, we want to have it in here. So um, I had one radio station finally pick me up in a very, very small town. Mm -hmm. um, so I advertised on that and that was very close to the end of everything. So vaping had, not that it was regulated yet, but it was a lot more known. It was a little bit more desensitized, but I was in it in the very beginning. So that you're talking about, you've got all the, I mean, the news articles coming out, the bashing coming out or the, this viewpoint and this viewpoint. So nobody wanted to touch it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so as far as creative marketing, I would pay people to do flyers. Mm -hmm. We'd have to literally old school marketing, go put flyers on the Walmart next to me, go to the college and put them in the college next to me. Um, and, and literally hand to mouth kind of marketing. And I'd pay people to put those flyers out. We would go to just different pop-up events. So if whatever town the store was in, um, some of them had like a weekend jazz festival or whatever, and there's a bunch of craft people out there. Mm -hmm. um, I'd have people go out there, set up a booth, say, hey, our store's down here just to drive traffic. Um, so it really was just like old school marketing. I, I couldn't even put mailers in in the mail. I see. So I went, I went to the mail office and they still said no. So yeah. So when you went to the radio station, do you have to pay for that or it's like free publicity? Yeah, no, it was fully paid for. Okay. And it was it. expensive and I don't think it was worth it. It wasn't worth it. You didn't make that <laughs> like, ROI from that. At the end, I really don't think it was worth it. I think my hand to hand holding flyers worked way better. <laughs> that I Got paid it. some kids to run around, that, that worked better. Yeah. Let's talk about your vision for the future. What, what, what's your plan? What's your game plan? Um, so now I'm kind of at a point in my life where I... I I mean, a lot of different avenues, right? So my vision is to just keep building that up and keep keep networking to see what comes. I'm never someone that says, no, I get into different industries all the time, um, but just ecosystem, ecosystem some of the things that I'm in. Um, and then coaching has become a passion as well because 
you know, none of us had a handbook, none of us had um, those, those guidance and those tips. And I didn't get coaching till later on in my life. And I wish I had it in the beginning. You know, I wish I could kind of help the, the youth in those times. Um, so, so my vision is really just to impact as many people as I can with, with my skills and what I do. Um, I have business goals, I have, you know, company goals, but that stuff doesn't impact me as much as, as helping others and, and getting out there and using my voice. So. so what do you do with your money when you first meet your million? Real estate. Real estate. <laughs> Whatever you invest you everything in. Okay, so you, re- you invested everything in real estate. Yeah, yeah. I, I had real estate and I had um, two other companies that were running. Um, so I, I expanded them a little bit, but yeah, honestly, I didn't, at that point, I didn't know what to do, right? I, I'm so tunnel visioned, you know, I don't know everything. I, I, you, it's almost as if you get to this level and every level you go, you realize there, there's so much more you don't know, right? Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. right then, the only thing I knew was, well, wealthy people buy real estate. That seems like a good <laughs> idea. And I have no time to pay attention how else to grow my money. Um, and I know that that's a safe bet. I got eyes on it. I can see it. Um, so, so that's really what I did. And then I went and just kind of scaled our other businesses and, and, um, uh, led me here. <laughs> Sounds good. And do you invest in like stocks and shares as well? And into other companies, buy other businesses? Uh, other companies. Yes. I, I try to More stay companies. out of stock. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, the, like opportunities come to me, um, that I will invest in, but it's not my, it's not my market. So it has to be someone that I really, really understand and trust and I'll, I'll go into it. Um, but it's, it's not my jam. So I just stick to what I'm good at and, and I love to listen and learn about it. Um, but I think to actually put your capital in and your money is completely different. So I, I think that's a similar strategy to JT. Like JT doesn't um, invest in stocks and shares. He only invests yeah. in real estate and sometimes in companies. Same thing for Robert Kiyosaki. They only invest in real estate. They, they don't invest in stocks and shares. Uh, they don't invest in stocks and shares that are publicly traded on the market. If they invest in stocks and shares, they invest in companies that are not are off the market. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. And I believe it's probably because of like you, you don't have control when it's something that's on the market, like the market controls yeah. and the CEO controls, you know, they can, dis- there's a lot of creative yeah. co- accounting and everything going on. Yeah. yeah. So um, do you think that an entrepreneur should always aim for an exit? So like build to sell, or do you think they should build to grow and like infinitely and like, you know, pass it on to their children? Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I always believe you should build to sell whether you're not going to sell or not, because to have the option at the end is better than not having the option. Like, I can't tell you how many people that sit down and have conversations with me and they're 60 years old and, oh, my son was taking it over. My son's the whole, their whole life and they're in denial, to, in, in full denial to themselves, right? So they realize, you know, either he doesn't want to take it over or she doesn't want to take it over. And they realize that they've built this family business that's solely they're the pulse of the business. So when I remove that person, the whole thing doesn't function. Um, and that's a little bit of, you know, working in your business and on your business and, and really trying to remove yourself from it. But if you build to sell, you always have the option whether you take it or not. And I still genuinely believe when you build to sell, you scale higher anyways, because mm-hmm. you're thinking of this big, big picture of someone's going to come in and, and purchase um, and at the end of the day, that's your call, whether you do it or not. Um, but I still think that your potential goes way higher when you do it that way. Got it. So let's talk about the systems in your business. Like how do you systemize, um, you know, so that it's easier for you to sell? To sell? Yeah. Like how do you systemize your business so that it's easier to sell? Like how do you create the SOPs? How do you, uh, yeah. Yeah. So it, it's really going to come down to people firstly. Um, making sure that you have right man- management teams in place, making sure that you have everyone in your company is knows what they're doing and there is a second level of authority to them. Um, so that was a huge thing for me. When I was scaling really quickly, I didn't have, I just had employees and I didn't really have like a floater manager, right? Or I'd have a manager in each store. And so to, to eventually keep putting those people in place, it kept not only making my life easier to focus on what was else was more important, with my time, um, it was making everyone function and smooth, have a smooth process in, in place. So people is huge um, and training the right people, like systems, we can do systems all day long. Like someone's really good at this and someone's really good at that. That's great. 
Um, but you're never going to sell a business unless it can fully function when you walk away, right? Mm -hmm. Because someone, it, when it comes to selling and systems, I need to be able to come in and it's just running like a website. Yeah. Even if it's a brick and mortar, it needs to be running like a website and there's some algorithm and this person is part of the algorithm and this person's part of the algorithm. And my job is to make sure that they are functioning together properly um, and that I don't really even need to come in. The only person I need to talk to is my right-hand person in whichever case it is. So it really is people. Got it. Can you share some numbers? Uh, um, like what's the revenue of each store? What's the profit of each store? What are the expenses? If you don't mind, yeah. Um, I can share a little bit. It was back in the day. Um, yeah. Multiple seven figures. Each store would depend. Um, you could have some stores that were in... 100 to 200,000, um, or you can have some stores that were doing a lot less, but the profit margins was the only thing I ever focused on mm -hmm. um, because I'd have some stores where my rent was $678 all in. Okay. And that one per was profit month. Rate crazy a per month. month. Per month. Okay. So I would do that, you know, in two hours, right? The sales yeah. would be in, and the rent was paid in two hours being open. So, um, so this one would have way less revenue but it was profiting way more for me. Um, so yeah, it was always multiple seven figures. The profit margins in wholesale were lower. So revenue was a lot higher, um, but it was really the, the storefronts that had those, those higher margins. So when you say- And expenses would really just be your, my overhead. So my expense side of it was obviously my payroll, my, my rent, um, my cost of goods, um, all those types of things, but I had no marketing. I had no, um, mm -hmm. a lot of things a normal business would have had as far as the expense side, I didn't have. I mean, Got accountants, it. lawyers, but yeah. So um, when you say $200,000, is that per month or per year or yeah? That would have yeah. been per month. Per yeah. Month. Okay. Wow. That's, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that's not, that's not, um, that's not dependent. That's dependent on the location. So, right. Like it was mul making multiple seven figures. A year. A year. Per store. Yeah. Right. So, um, Not per store. Per store? Or, or for Not all 12 stores? Yes. For all 12 stores. Okay. Got it. Um, so, what are, okay, last question. What are the top three business tips you want to share with someone who's just starting out and someone who's already at maybe seven figures? How do you get to eight? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, someone that's just starting out, the success is in the repetition. Mm -hmm. So whatever you choose to be your goal, just keep the repetition going and have that fire and that work ethic to go and do it. Mm -hmm. um, someone who's at that level trying to go to the next level, every level you go, it's like new level, new devil. Um, you, need, you need people in your life that are always above you, that you can always strive from um, because it is a completely different animal. I always say more money, more problems, because it's, it's the truth. Um, and every level you go, there there's different legal issues. There's different, you know, scaling issues. There's different, so many different levels. Um, so if you're at that level, trust in someone who's already done it to take you to where you want to go. Um, if you're starting out, have all the fire in you and just project that and success and repetition. Sounds good. What, what about from someone going from six to seven figures? Six to seven figures. That's a hurdle. That, that is a little bit of a hurdle. Um, keep your uh, expenses down as much as you can. Cut where you can. Mm -hmm. I think when you, when you start going from that six to seven figure range, um, you hit this hump of you're doing so much and you're not keeping an eye on the numbers. So, or you're not keeping an eye on, on where all your extra spending is coming from. That profit margin is your golden ticket. To going from six to seven figures so don't just you know hire the software or do this because it's going to make your life easier do the research and keep that expense number down as much as you can to just finally get over that seven figure hurdle but do you think um profit margin is more important or revenue is more important like would you yeah margin 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 yeah but from because uh... so many people so many people even big 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 companies pay Big, big, big consultants, I know, because there's many in my family to go in there, and they have no idea what's going out. No idea. There's just someone that sits in a desk and writes a check all day long. Got it. Um, and, and if you don't keep an eye on that, your, your margins aren't 
aren't going to be there. Like, yes, revenue is extremely important because you want to keep, keep growing, get new customers, build it and expand it. Mm -hmm. Um, but sometimes you have to pay attention to what's right in front of you instead of just always grasping. I think that's an interesting point because I was just listening to another business coach uh, recently, I think maybe a few months ago, and he was talking about like how um, they all focus on revenue. Where it, like if you look at every tech company, every Silicon Valley startup, they, they don't focus on on um, profit margins at all. That's irrelevant. Yeah. Any venture capital backed company focuses on revenue, and um, because like from a selling standpoint, if you want to, if you're building it to sell. They, they would say that revenue is the most important, but I think it's an interesting, um, yeah. what do you have to say to them <laughs> for those that <laughs> argue They're that revenue important. is important? Yeah, I'm not saying that like the, the growing aspect and the revenue aspect isn't important. I just think that 90% of people don't look at their expense spend. Correct. And I think that so many more companies could probably generate more revenue if they paid attention to that. So that's, that's what I say to it. I think profit margins are more important. <laughs> got it, got it. Because, because as you grow, as you scale naturally, the margins will shrink. Even when like like when I run ads or something, um, and when I'm spending about $30,000 $30, a month on ads, my profit margin compared to when I'm spending $500 a month on ads is a lot, it's a lot different, right? The, the return yeah. on ad spend is a lot different, yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I, I mean, we can say both is important. Everyone will have their own. Um, yeah, and it, it also depends, right? Like if you're, it's more of like a, yes, if you're building to sell or if you're trying to sell, you're in that stage of you're getting your company ready to sell or you're in that growing stage, right? And, and that's where I said that, right? Like six to seven figures, you need to pay attention there because so many people don't go over that hump um, because they're hiring more people or they're stressed out and they, it's just chaos, right? Um, but every, every level you go, they're both important. We're gonna, so, we could debate for an hour. So, no, I'm, I'm, I'm on neither camp, yeah. So um, have you thought of um, listing a company on the, on the stock exchange before? ipo a company? Um, it's not really my thing, no. Yes and no, like, I mean, maybe. Not really, no. <laughs> not really. All right. So I'm not if, even going to get into my version of why I think that, but. <laughs> you could, you could, if you want to share, you could. Because everyone has their own, everyone has a different lifestyle. Like, you know, everyone runs, every entrepreneur is different, you know. Some do it as a lifestyle, some do it to, you know, everyone has their own. Maybe you could share yours if you want to, yeah. Of, of like why I'm an entrepreneur? No, like why you don't want to list on the... List? Yeah. I, I don't you know. Well, pass, 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 <laughs> pass. You offend a lot of people. <laughs> you, you, you treasure your freedom more, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I, I believe like all the CEOs of those public listed companies, they don't really have freedom. Right? I mean, like there's a lot of responsibility with great power comes great responsibility. Okay, great. So um, if anyone wants to follow you, what are your social media channels? Uh, yeah, well, so yeah, just, just jump channels. on to um, Instagram. It's KDK official, and um, on Facebook you can reach out to me on there or LinkedIn. Okay, so it's KTK K A T I E K A Y official, and on Clubhouse you're. Uh, same thing. Actually, I had to do a different one. I think it's the real KDK. The real someone KDK. stole KDK from me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sounds good. All right, I hope all of you enjoyed this interview. Um, if you like it, make sure you share it and subscribe to this channel for more interviews like that. Thank you. Oh,